there are several ways to construct a regression model. The first method is by forward model construction. Forward model construction starts from an empty model and will add uh, predictors to the model until we reach a final significant model. Backward model construction does the opposite. It starts from a full, uh, a full model containing all possible predictors and then it will remove those until it gets to the final model. And then the third option is to use a combination of both. It is, however, important to note that every predictor will always be included one by one. So we will never add one, more than one predictor at the same time. We will never remove more than one predictor at the same time. Furthermore, the models are hierarchically, which means that if we have higher order terms or interaction terms, we always have to keep the lower order terms that consist or that make part of this higher order term. We have to keep them in the model. We cannot delete them even if they are insignificant. So what we will be using is forward model construction because this is the easiest way and it's also the most um, logical way in my opinion. So forward model construction will include predictors one by one. What it will do is it will start from the empty model. It will look at what predictors are available and then it will construct a, single li a simple linear regression model with one predictor. So it will check for each of those predictors what the model would be. So you get, uh, in our case, four models. You select the model which has the most significant predictor. So in most significant predictor here means that we include the one which has um, the highest absolute value in T, absolute T value, or which has the lowest P value. So we always include the most significant predictor in our model. Um, why is this the most significant predictor? Because if my p-value is the lowest, it means it is farthest away from the center. And so we are most certain that this predictor is significantly different from zero. We add this predictor to the model, and now we start again. So we have now selected one predictor, and we will check this predictor by adding each of the other different predictors as well. So we take models with two predictors, um, the one we select plus every other possible predictor. And again, we see which one gives the most significant um, contribution. We take this. Now we have a model with two predictors. We check if both of them are still significant. If not, we have to remove. And then we select. So we have the one with the two predictors. We add every remaining predictor. We get a model with three predictors. We check again if all of them are significant. If not, we remove one by one and we continue back with the forward step by adding a predictor. Only when we finished adding all the predictors in themselves, so all the single predictors, then we can move on to higher order or interaction terms. So higher order or interaction terms are not um, added in an exhaustive way, especially not for large models, because um, there are too many and um, it, would, yeah, it would make the model too heavy to work with. Also, you have the, the problem of multiple testing. So the more you test, the more likely you are to find a uh, false positive. So that you think that something is significant, which is not significant or vice versa. So higher order terms will mostly be considered to include based on biological insight. So is it or does it make sense to include this interaction term? Does it make sense to include this higher order term? For higher order terms, we usually look at the residual plot because that one gives us an idea whether or not we would include a square or a cubic term. For the interaction terms, we rely on judgment. Um, one important remark is that for constructing a statistical model, we will usually look at a significance level of 10%, not 5%, so, so as to be not too strict and to include a significant number of significant predictors. Let's now take it to our example of the larges. So in the larges, we had four minerals that we wanted to add. We check them, so we make a model with one predictor, nitrogen. We make a model with one predictor, phosphor, one predictor, potassium, one predictor, residual ash. In this, we see the T-values, 6.97, 599, 635, 587, and we select the one that is most significant. So the one that has the highest absolute T-value. In this case, it's nitrogen. So we add nitrogen to the model. Nitrogen is now the base or the first predictor in the model. And now we see what happens if we add any of the other predictors. So we 
take a model with nitrogen and phosphor, we take a model with nitrogen and potassium, and a model with nitrogen and residual ash. Here again, the one that, that is most significant is potassium. So in the next step, we will add potassium to nitrogen. So we have a model with two predictors, nitrogen and potassium. Now we have to check if both of them are still, predict, uh, are still significant. So for potassium, we know it is significant. If you check the R output, you will see that the nitrogen is also still significant. So we keep both of them and we go to the next step. We take a model with nitrogen and potassium. We add phosphor and we add residual ash. So we get two models with three predictors. We select again the one that is most significant. We check if all of the predictors are still significant. If not, we remove them one by one, and then we repeat the entire process until there are no more significant predictors to be added. So once we have finished up all the predictors, then, only then, we will move on and look at the interaction terms. So interaction terms, we check for the interaction terms only for the terms which are in the model. So um, in our model, we will get nitrogen and potassium and phosphor and residual ash. In the first step, we will then check all the different uh, combinations, nitrogen with potassium, nitri nitrogen with phosphor, nitrogen with residual ash, potassium with phosphor, potassium with residual ash, and phosphor with residual, residual ash. And then we select the one that's most significant, and the entire process continues. In the end, what we get is this model. So model L5 is a model which contains nitrogen, phosphor, potassium, and residual ash. So all four of the minerals are included. And we have two interaction terms. We have an interaction term between nitrogen and phosphor. So it means that they are related in, their, um, in the way they contribute to the tree length. And phosphor with residual ash. If we take a look at the p-values here, we see that these two, so the one for nitrogen and one for phosphor, they are larger than 10%. So they are in itself not significant. However, since we are building the model hierarchically, it means that we have to include them anyway, because we have this, sorry, we have this interaction term, nitrogen with phosphor. This one is significant, so it means that nitrogen and phosphor separately also have to remain in the model. Another thing that we can look at is here, the multiple R squared. So multiple R squared is a measure of how predictive the model is. We will see the details later on in this uh, chapter. But for now, we can say it's 91%. So the model is strongly predictive based, uh, or the model constructed with these predictors is strongly predictive for the average tree length. Um, one final remark is that how to construct a model will depend on the goal of your analysis. What do I want to do with it? Do I want to make predictions? Or do I want to find an effect of an exposure on an outcome? So do I want to input new data and get an output for the tree length? Or do I want to see how is residual ash contributing to the tree length? Two different things. And model construction is, um, or the way of thinking of model construction is different for both. If we want to make predictions, the strategy that we used is useful. So in that case, we want to avoid overfitting. We want to find a prediction which is as good as possible. So what we want to do is to include only the really significant terms. Overfitting means basically that you want the data or that you want the model to follow the data, but not too closely. So we have the data points, the six data points here. This ones. And we want to find the model that fits it. If you put a linear regression to it, we get a blue line. So we see that we get a line which increases, which follows the data very nicely. Um, if we go to higher order fits, for example, we include um, cubic terms, we might get the green line. So we see that the green line is a perfect fit for all of the data points. So for the observations, for the observed data points, the, the line goes through them, it's a perfect fit. However, for every other point, it is a very bad fit. So if we would take a prediction for Let's say this one. The prediction would be here, which is an option. If we would take a prediction, well, which is an option depending on what we get, because it is 
close to the point near to it, it's far from the linear line. So if the data points, we have no clue how they are exactly spread. So if this is how they are spread, and this would be the true value, then it's a bad fit. We also see on the end that we go farther and farther away from the data. So the bulk of the data will lie in this direction. So it will follow the linear regression line. But if we follow the green line and we want to make predictions, we move either down here or up here. So we have a very, very bad fit. The model is a very bad generalization of the true underlying model. If you want to find the effect of an exposure on the outcome, then it's important to uh, correct for confounding. So we want to adjust for all confounders. And in that case, we are not going to use the strategy before. We just want to include as many terms as possible, as many predictors as possible, to eradicate confounding as much as, much as possible.